Take your Bible and turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 18. Book of Proverbs chapter 18. I got some verses up on the screen. And they're all out of that chapter. God's laid a message on my heart. And it's based on some things that I've gone through. And some things that some other people have gone through. When I was young, I was... Uh, I was intimidated easily by bigger kids and in some cases a few littler ones and you know I let some guys bully me they called me names dirty names and even as a young boy, I just, you know, I, I can remember asking myself or maybe asking God, why are, these, why are people like that? Are they, are they abused at home? I, I can remember thinking this as a boy. Are they, are they not happy growing up? Or, you know, what causes people to want to be that way? I don't. You know, I tried it a little bit. I'm not a bully. It's not my nature. Uh, and I have a sin nature like everybody else. And I'm not saying I've never tried to exert pressure on somebody. But it's just not, it's not how God made me. And my mom, you know, she was a good mom. She loved her son. But she got tired of me running home crying. Because the boys were saying something about me. So she told me to hit them. Hit them back. Well, I tried that once on a boy. I popped him good on the side of the head. He went and told his big sister. She come down. I went, uh-oh. So I thought about running to get my big sister... And I don't think she was home at the time. Um, but other than that, I just, I usually ran from everything my mouth started. Hush, quit your laughing. But I, I just knew I didn't like it. You know, we have, we have kids now that go to school and they pull a gun out and they shoot kids at school and in some cases those boys were badly bullied and they had taken all they were going to take and they just they had enough of it the devil's a bully the devil is a bully he tries to take what doesn't belong to him he tries to force his way into everything that's not his business. He doesn't matter who he kills. He doesn't care who he hurts. As long as he gets his way. He's a bully. And he's a dragon, a serpent. I guess that's how God designed him. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures that Jesus was not that way. Proverbs 18, verse 6 says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. Now you get wisdom out of that. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. I've told my boys, you better watch that mouth. I remember lipping off to my mother one day, and I had the misfortune... Of sitting in the front seat. And she popped me upside my lips. And I tasted blood. She said, don't you ever talk to me that way. She was right. So I tell my boys, 
Better watch that mouth of yours. Better watch that mouth. You're going to carry that someplace and somebody's going to pop you over that. You're going to spit or swallow teeth. And when it happens, I hope to God you remember what I said. You better watch that mouth. That Bible's right, amen? Proverbs 18, 7. A fool's mouth is his destruction. And his lips are the snare of his soul. That means your cocky, arrogant mouth will always get you in trouble. Brother Sterling told me a story when he was a boy in school. There was a bully there. And that bully come up the steps and just pushing kids out of his way. And he got up to Sterling. I don't know how old Sterling was. He wasn't in school too awful long. So he couldn't have been too old. But he, he come up on Sterling and he went to push and Sterling didn't move. And that boy looked at him and Sterling turned around and went, whoom, like that. And there he went rolling down the steps. And he never pushed him again. Now Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. You know what that word means? Cocky, arrogant, full of pride. There are three sins you could commit. The lust of the flesh... Which I'm sure all of us are familiar with. Lust of the eyes. And that doesn't just mean looking at some woman or some man. You could look at a house or a car or a fishing pole or anything and lust after it. But the third one, and I, I really do mean, I think I'd rather be guilty of the first two than the third one. Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before honor is humility. You write that in your heart. Proverbs eighteen fourteen: The spirit of man will sustain his infirmity. But a wounded spirit... You listen to this. A wounded spirit, who can bear? When you are the recipient of what a bully does, you are wounded. They say sticks and stones break my bones, but words cannot harm me. That is a lie. I'd rather be hit. Please don't hit me. I'd rather be hit than yelled at. I'd rather be slapped than called a dirty name. When I was young, and Lisa and I were newly married, I did, some, did a side job, Brian, for a family south south county and they had a they had a teenage girl there and i was down in the basement doing work and that mother cursed that girl and i sat and listened to that and i'm going she's going to despise you one of these days you're going to pay for that that mother is going to end up paying for that a wounded spirit who can bear. I want you to look at verse 19 because that was the verse I was looking for when I landed in Proverbs 18. And I want you to underline this verse in your Bible. A brother offended. Now listen to it. Now he didn't say a stranger. He said a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Now you underline that verse. This Bible's right. We lay stones of offense in front of people. I've offended people by things I've said about them or to them. I have offended people. I offended our neighbor over here, whose little boy would come over and sneak over on our play on our school playground, and I kept running him off. She come up. I was in my office. I yelled at her son, and I came in my office was making videos, and next thing I know, I hear the door slam in my office. I turn around, and that she bear was looking at me, and she let me have it. And I let her have it back. 
You know, six months later, God dealt with me so hard about that that I went over to her house and her little boy answered the door and he said, well, my mom's napping. I said, I think she'll want to wake up for this. So go get her. So she came to the door and the ice in her eyes told me she just, what do you want? And I said, you're our neighbor. And I want you to know that I was wrong for yelling at your son. And as I said these words, her countenance changed right in front of me. And I said, I'm asking for your forgiveness. And I said, your son can come over and play on our playground anytime he wants. And with tears in her eyes, she said, I was just talking to my husband about us getting in church. We'll be there Sunday. I had removed from her that stone of offense that I laid there. If you're wondering why you've got lost relatives that are not getting saved, ask God if you've laid a stone of offense in front of them that's keeping them from the gospel. It's possible, is it not, that we did something? And you look at your Bible. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. You know what I've run into? People who with their mouth just make themselves an offense to everybody around them and they demand that you forget about it. You get over it. And this Bible knows us and it knows that we can get bitter against somebody or somebody can get bitter against us. Once we've offended them, they will turn on us and you may never win them back over again. Is this Bible right? And then verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself how? And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We all know who that is, amen? But I, wanna, I want you to focus on verse 19. Contentions are like the bars of a castle. And once that offense has been laid, it's a miracle of God if it's ever removed. And I want to tell you something. Don't think that time will heal all wounds. Because some people's going to hate you the rest of your life. And I have to live with that. And I don't like it. Now, it's my job to say things that maybe sometimes y'all don't want to hear. I will never apologize for that. And I understand that sometimes just preaching the Bible can be an offense to people. There are things that people hold against me that God is my witness. I do not believe I did them any wrong. However, there are people out there who hate my guts. Because I, I did do something wrong. And I got to live with that. And it's not easy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I want your help preaching the message. It's going to be rough. And I'm going to say some things that will make some people mad. And Father, I've sought you on this and asked you how to do it. You've shown me the way. Father, I do not want to hurt anybody. Especially someone who's guilty of what I'm about to say. So God, I pray, Father, in meekness that your word would go forth.
and do that which it's supposed to do, and do that what's need to be done. And Father, just deal with us. If we're bullies, help us, Father, who have been pushed and provoked to forget those things that are behind and press toward the mark. There are better things to do in life than to dwell on what somebody's done to us. And I know how hard that is. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you'd give us grace this morning. Help me to preach your word. Pray that you'd bless it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Proverbs 6, very quickly. Proverbs chapter 6. Underline these in your Bible. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. Abomination. Now you listen to your Bible. When God says something is an abomination, it means it was birthed by a, a harlot spirit. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It means that you are not saved. It, that's what that means. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Let me, let me get into the message here real quick. I hate bullies. I hate them. I hate seeing people pushed around. That bothers me. And I've had to deal with people who are bullies. And sit them down, talk to them, and say, you can't treat people like that. What makes you think you can come in here and treat people like that? We had a family move here. I knew, I knew it wasn't of God that they moved here. And the man told me, we've been pushed out of five churches so far. This was the sixth one. Second Baptist was the seventh one. Because Brother Waymar called me on this same family. He said, you know anything about them? I said, yeah. And I told him. He said, I'm fixing to put them out. That whole family. You know what that man told me in my office? I just don't, I just don't understand why people won't do what I tell them to do around here. He said, I can't understand why when I see people doing wrong and I tell them what they're doing wrong, how come they don't do right? I said, it's not your place. Him and his wife both thought they could bully and push and run their mouth about everybody. They were found out they were secretly working with Brady behind the scenes to pull him away, start another church. I found that out the night that I put them out. New Year's Eve night. I don't like bullies. I don't like men that are bullies. Big men or little men who think they're big. Who because of a cocky, arrogant, haughty spirit think that everybody ought to bow to them and give in to them. There's something wrong with their thinking. Something wrong in their head. I don't like women that are bullies. Nobody loves a screeching woman's voice. Nobody does. And let me tell you something. Your children would rather be whipped than cursed at and called names by their own mom and dad. They would rather you spank them then for you to say the things that you've said to your children, you should have never said it. I don't like men that are bullies. I don't like women that are bullies. I don't like policemen that are bullies. And I love policemen. But that is an offense against the people that they swore to serve and protect. I don't like preachers that are bullies. And I've seen a mess of them. Stephen Anderson's one of them. You can send him this recording. I don't care. That man's a cocky, arrogant bully. You know what he did? Right in the middle of the church service, he got a man. 
I don't know what he said to him. Alicia sent me the video, told me about it. And during the service, he said, you get up, you get on out of here. And then somebody kind of defended him. He said, you know, he's a visitor here. He he don't know anything. He said, you go with him. I've seen preachers in their pulpits call out people by name and point their finger at them. Tell everybody their nasty little sins. And say, you deserve to have that. You deserve to have that preached to in this church. I'm your, that's a bully. I don't like that. That ain't right. That's not what God called us to be. And I've seen bully preachers. They've stood in this pulpit and bullied people to where they couldn't take it no more. And they left. And he's going, I don't know why everybody's leaving. Because you're a bully. You don't know how to feed sheep. You just know how to use the rod. But anyway, these six things are an abomination to God. A proud look, seven of them. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet to be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God hates them. And so should you. Now turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Let me tell you one of the qualifications for being a bishop. Is that he's not to be a brawler. It says that specifically in the text of the scriptures. He's to be no brawler. And I know a pastor. I know a pastor. Who got into it with a man. The man was wrong. But he got into it with the man. And the man mouthed off back to this pastor wasn't related to the church in any way and they got into it and that pastor beat that guy up sent him home thinking now the guy started it but the pastor got into the fight you know what he did the next day he stood up in front of his church and he said I resign He said, the Bible says I'm qualifications of the bishop. He used to be no brawler. And he said, I brawled. And he stepped down out of that church. Now he's got good men in that church. And those good men got together and they found out what happened. And they had prayer for their pastor. And then they said, where is our pastor? They said, well, we think he went to talk to the man to apologize to him. So those men in that church went to that man's house and that man said, yeah, he was here. And he said, you know what? I deserved it. I started to fight. I had it coming. I was in the wrong. And he said, you've got a good man at that church. You need to hang on to him. And they went to his house and restored him to fellowship. It was the right thing to do. He's pastoring now. I'm not going to say his name. If I did, you'd know it. That's what he did. We're not always qualified to do what we do. And God has to deal with us. But this is not to the pastors. This is to the church folk. Titus 3, chapter 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. You know what that is? Authority. Put them in mind to be subject to authority and to obey magistrates. You know who that is? Policemen. Judges. City officials. To be ready. You know what that means? Don't cheat on your taxes. You know what that means? Don't break the speed limit. You know what that means? Don't carry marijuana in your car. To be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. That's what your Bible says. Turn to Galatians chapter 5.
I'm going to tell you a story here in a minute of something that happened to a man sitting in this church this morning. I've spoken to him. He's given me permission to say what I'm going to say however I see fit to say it, including using names. I am going to withdraw from speaking one name. For the gospel's sake. And I assure you, I'm following scriptures. If somebody's caught in sin, somebody goes to them, and if repentance is made, it's over with. Do you know that I've had to go to people sitting in this room, this today, and talk to them about their sin? Do you know that? No, you don't know that. Do you know why you don't know that? Because I had to follow the scriptures. If it gets to a point to where there's no repentance, I'll stand in front of this church and tell it. You better believe it. And I've never had to do that yet. Because most people just bow out. And once that happens... I am not under obligation to bring it to the church because they're not here. This is why I'm going to withhold the name of one person. They used to be part of this church and now they're not. Galatians 5.19 Galatians 5 tells you two types of people. Those who are saved and those who are not saved. How do we know? Fruit. Fruit. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. You see that word manifest? It means obvious. Which are these? Adultery. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Verse 20, idolatry. And Paul said that was covetousness. Witchcraft. I have underlined hatred. Variance. You know what that is? Somebody that's just got to be contrary to everything that's said and done. I had a man come to me from this church. To try to explain to me some new revelation that he had from God about Israel. And he said, I just want to talk it over with you. I said, okay. I said, now, if you say something and I believe it's wrong, I'm going to correct you according to scripture. He said, that's fine. And he, he talked and gave his idea. And I said, now, let me tell you what the scripture says. And he literally argued with me on everything that I said. I mean, he would not let me finish one sentence. He kept cutting me off. And finally, I just said, I'm done. He said, well, I won't talk. I said, you won't let me talk. You don't want us to have a conversation. You want to dominate me and cut off everything. And he cut me off then. I said, see, you're doing it now. I said, so there's no point in me talking anymore. Have a good day. So he told my sister that I threw him out of the church. But he was at variance. He had to be contrary to everything that I said. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. And that's what he told me. What he said was heresy. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now I'm going to, tell, I'm going to say this. Men who will beat their wives are capable of killing their wives. Don't tell me they're not. Don't tell me they're not. It's happened. Of the which I tell you before, my daughter was beaten several times by an abusive husband. 
And I found out yesterday why he never would let her have a gun. Because she's a dead aim. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you believe your Bible? Say amen. Now, look at Galatians 5.22. He's going to give you the opposite. Notice what I have underlined. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There's nine of those. And out of nine of those... Only two of them apply to your relationship with you and God. One of them, faith. The rest of them apply to how you treat everybody around you. Love. Having peace with them. Long-suffering with them. Being gentle with people. Being good to people. Being meek to people. Temperance with people. You know what temperance means? That you've got an ability to bite your tongue and hold your peace. That's temperance. Last Saturday night. They were celebrating Madeline's birthday. It was Madeline and her sister, her sister's boyfriend, Cameron, Madeline's husband, Madeline's father, and three people who used to go to this church. And something was said in a semi-joking manner by one man there at the table and Cameron said yeah I do the same thing with Madeline that's my wife so the man got up walked outside come back in five minutes later said Cameron I will to see you outside So he took Cameron outside to the darkest part of the driveway and said, sit down. Cameron said, what are you doing? He said, I told you to sit down. And he made him sit on the ground. So now he's got this over him. Now I'm going to tell you something. That is not the first time this man has done this in this church. But it better be the last. And this man cursed him four, five times, called him a little, just fill in a word. And he said, I got you now. He had been building this up for a long time. Milton and Althea told me the story last Sunday. Milton said, I want to go talk to a man. I said, go talk to him. I'll turn my head. This man jumped on Cameron. And began to beat on him. Cameron bloodied and broke his nose. Bashed the right side of his face in. Blood everywhere. No, it wasn't Madeline's dad. He stood up for Madeline and Cameron. He said, you get out of my house. Don't you ever come back here. That happened. They said, I could tell the story. Because that's happened to people in this church by this man before. And it better be the last time. Because I had confronted him several times about it. Bullying people. I don't go for that. I do not go for that. And unless you want me to sit you down, you better not, I better not find out you did it. Because I will exert pastoral authority. And if I have to, I will bring it before this church. Don't you ever bully somebody in this church. Ever. 
Now let me tell you, that was supposedly a Christian man who did not exhibit love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, or temperance. Instead, hatred, variance, wrath, strife. And that is you if you ever bully somebody. Let me tell you what the Bible says we're supposed to be. Meek does not mean weak. It takes more strength to bite your tongue than it does to use it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. But he was in authority. And even when his sister and brother stood against him, Moses did not argue back with them. He said, God, you deal with it. And God inflicted his sister with leprosy, put her out. She had to sit outside the camp and suffer her shame for seven days before they would let her back in. God was being merciful to that woman. And God blessed Moses for being meek. Psalm 25, 9, the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. This man tries to be a teacher and yet he knows nothing. He knows nothing about Bible Christianity. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. You didn't go down there, did you, Milton? You know why he didn't? Meek. It's better to let God take care of it. It's better. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, who's he going to save? The Lord lifted up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. This Bible's right. By the way, don't ever make me preach a sermon on you. Don't, don't do that. I am not enjoying this. I am not enjoying this. This is not my way of getting back. If it was, I'd have said his name. Isaiah 11, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That means God will be on your side. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. God will get him. But Cameron, you did the right thing. You had to defend yourself. And nobody faults you. Nobody. See, I, I called the man Sunday afternoon. And he told me what happened. I wanted to hear from him. And then I asked his permission. Talk it over with your wife. If you want me to say it, I will. If not, I'll, I'll hold my tongue. And he said, it's okay, Brother Mike. That's a good young man. You folks are proud of you, son. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the... Bullies don't know what the gospel is. They don't know what forgiveness is. They don't know what meekness is. They don't know what righteousness is. They know nothing. Zephaniah 2, 3, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. When God comes down, he'll get them. But he'll save you. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 11. Here's Jesus. Here's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly and you shall find rest under your souls. Jesus let them put him on the cross. He let them nail him there. He let them hang him on a tree. He let them do it. Showing meekness. 
the whole time. Turning the other cheek when they smote him. Here. Turn here. And Jesus says, take that yoke upon you. What will you? Shall I come unto you with a... Here's Paul. Shall I come unto you with a rod? Or in the spirit of meekness? I would rather have to come to you in this church with meekness. Than to have to come to you with a rod. But mark my words. If I have to use the rod, I will. Ask my daughters. And as I've said, I have made it a point to go to people who are sitting in this room to confront them with meekness, to restore such a one. Not to bully. I've had it done to me. I've had people come to me and confront me about my sin. To restore me. Or I wouldn't be here today. Galatians 6.1 Brethren, here's what you're supposed to do, guys. Listen, here's your Bible. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If somebody did something wrong, first thing to do is tell God. Ask God how to deal with it. Maybe God will deal with it, and you won't have to. Because I'll tell you, there's just something about somebody who always keeps injecting themselves in everybody's lives and busy body stuff. That stuff ain't right. And I've seen that one before too. But there is restoration with the spirit of meekness. And you know, once that happens, it doesn't matter who finds out about it. You're forgiven. And what that means is, your sin is no worse than mine. Or y'all's. So what if you found out something somebody did? Ask the question, did God deal with it? Or can God, do you not think God sees everything that everybody does and he knows how to take care of it but some people think they're the police of the church we already have an accuser of the brethren we don't, that office is filled there are no vacancies Ladies, this one specifically for you. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is great in this, which is in the sight of God of great pride. There's your, there's your pearl right there. Your pearl of great price, ladies, the most expensive jewel you'll wear on your crown is your meek and quiet spirit. And there are ladies in this church that are eat up with meekness and quietness. And I love you for that. I, I want to call your name out there, everybody, embarrass you publicly. Because I know you to be a meek person. But ladies, that's your verse. Because women can be bullies too. And it ain't right. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of a reason, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And I've seen people who thought that God had called them to go out and bully people into salvation. That's wicked. 
That's, that's wicked. To go and bully a lost man. You wicked heathen, you old sinner. You deserve hell. And think that they're doing the service of God. That's not what he told us to do. Jesus did not do not do that to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. So I don't know what the result of this message is supposed to be. Except if you're a bully, stop it. Ask God to change you. You know he'll do it. How many people in this church have raised their hand and said, God has changed my character, my nature, my wickedness? Look around you. Look around you. God can change anybody. My prayer is today that those of you who have a bully nature, a bully spirit, that God will convict you of it. Those of you online, those of you in Kenya. Hey, your tribes don't get along out there. I know it. And you know it. But what if you've got brethren in a different tribe? You going to fight with them? You going to go against them, your own brothers? Just because they're from a different tribe? That don't matter. God's going to make you sit together. That's what my mom did. When me and Melissa got at each other, mom made us sit together, put our arms around each other. That was worse than castor oil. God will make you sit next to somebody you hate and love them. Put your arm around them. My prayer is that the bullies will stop. My prayer also is that God will heal wounded hearts. God will heal wounded hearts. I'm a pastor who is all about forgiveness, restoration, forgetting those things that are behind. And I've had my feel of this stuff. And I want to be done with it. I want it over with. This morning, I want you to bow your head. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But I'm going to try to see if I can get the Holy Ghost to convict you a little bit. That is my job. Number one, I'm going to ask you if you're saved. Did you know your church attendance does not make you saved? Putting money in the plate does not make you saved. You watching videos online does not make you saved. I'm going to ask you if you are saved, number one. And the fruit will bear witness. The fruit will bear witness. Number two, I'm going to ask you a question. Who are you angry with? Right now, who are you angry with? And I'm going to ask you, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ's body... That you let it go. And I know it's not easy. I've got great bitterness in my heart. And my wife and family knows that I, I often struggle with that. And I don't want to be that way. So whoever you're angry with, whoever you have a contention with, whoever you have a bone to pick, for the sake of Christ and your own conscience, can you let it go today? Those of you who have been wounded, there are some who were abused as children. There are those who were abused as wives. There are even those who were abused as husbands. And I'm going to ask you this morning, 
Are you ready to let it go? For the sake of your own conscience, for the sake of Christ and His body, will you ask God to help you be free? Father, I come before you today. I love you. And I've done some great harm. I have a lot of regrets. And even though, Father, I know, Lord, that the first time I asked you to forgive me, you forgave me. But I often don't forgive myself. And I often repeat asking you for forgiveness for the same thing. And God, there are people who I've hurt with my mouth. Deliberately. God help me remove the stones of offense that I have laid. And Father those who have deeply wounded and offended me. Help me Father. To be bigger than the offense. More mature than those who offended. And meek, the way my Savior was, who went to the cross to die for those who offended him. If soldiers can fight for our country to protect flag burners, then help us, Father, to be beyond offense. Your word says, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And that verse is true. When our eyes are set on you, Father, nobody can offend us. Father, I pray, Lord, for those who have a bully nature. Lots of people are guilty of it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would reach down from heaven. You would change them. You'd make them whole again. And deliver them, Father. Male or female, even children. Deliver them from it. And Father, for those that are wounded, to be healed by the soothing salve of the Word of God. Thank you for the medicine that's in your Bible. And the profound wisdom that guides us through our lives to show us right from wrong. And though we know what's right, we often struggle to live by what's right. And therein we ask your forgiveness, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, your Son. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you bless our church and help us to move beyond these things. Praying for those souls who are affected by all these things and praying that lost people lost sheep might one day be restored through the grace the great mercy that you bestow upon us Heavenly Father Father I thank you for my church and I love them help me to never offend them because I'm capable of it. Father, I've offended even my own family with my mouth. Forgive me as they have forgiven me. Father, help me to always do what's right with my people. And if I see wrong, to deal with it in the spirit of meekness and restoration the way you have dealt with me. And in that, Father, you will be glorified. And your church will be beatified you will adorn our church with a great pearl of great price by giving our church a meek and a quiet spirit honoring our Lord our husband always bless us in the name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said